It's also a little echoey. So welcome to the March 23rd we go. meeting of the Rotary Club of Beaver Creek. Who knows how to like turn it down a little? I do not know if we're zooming. Uh, okay. I'd like to thank, uh, I'm going to wait to jump it down. Dave and Beth Cusack uh, for being our readers today. Eric Marcus for Ticket Master and IT Solutions. Hey, Jerry. And, and Jerry. And everything else. We'll get parents. Pete Bales, Mark Weinstein, and Mike Zwick for the programs. Right. Then. And I think that's a lot better. Yeah. And Jim Gumbel for the website. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Dean Jarvey. The song. Would you please join me in a prayer? Let's. Pray silently together, each of us according to our own individual beliefs. Let us offer thanks for our food, for our blessings of being with one another, for absent friends, and let us be a source of hope of those in need and contentment for those who are lonely. Let us give gratitude for the opportunities for rotary, the feelings of love, kindness, well-directed, a gentle spirit always reflecting in action. That pause. Yeah, it was, it was the song that was over on again. I was like, I think the climate change I think is now March showers bring April flowers. You know, like, <laughs> I've been watching as all the daffodils and tulips in our yard come racing up uh, in the past few weeks, and some of them have already bloomed. Uh, I think the daffodils, uh, I always forget which one in first. But yeah, beautiful afternoon here. Uh, Second report to our man with many hats, if he can even hear me. Hundred percent attendance. Hundred percent attendance. Um, let's see. Starting that off with Don Adams. Good afternoon. We just came from. Uh, Pete Lander, Pete Bells, and Charles Turner and I just came from Rotary Children's with, I think, all of the, the elected officials in Ohio and some from the federal government that did the groundbreaking out here. So now I'm here with a much nicer group. Oh, <laughs> it was there too. I thought so. Yeah, it's a victim of them. Today is March 3rd, 2023. It's also 33 for today. And you should know who that goes with. It's going to be a bacon day. Dressed in blue day. Charles got the message. Uh, I want to be happy. Oh, I want you to be happy day. National Anthem Day. For two courses of tools, National Sales Person Day. And Simplify Your Life Day. And Talk in Third Person Day. <laughs> In history today, in, in 1634, the first U.S. internal revenue. I can't get it right. Maybe it's you know, tendency to spill spirits of carriages. 1791, first town in Boston opened. And in 1791, the Congress established the first U.S. Mint. In 1837, Congress increased from U.S. increased to U.S. Supreme Court membership from seven to nine. And in 1847, the U.S. Post Office authorized to issue postage stamps for the first time. And then they had authorized uh, registered mail in 1855. And for some of you that grew up in my time, in 1863, the first U.S. wartime military conscription bill was enacted, the 20th wave, uh, wave of the 70s. So, uh, 1933, Mount Rushmore was dedicated. And in 2005, Steve Fawcett became the first person to fly an airplane around the world 
solo without any stops within for refueling or without refueling. Mm -hmm. It's a journey of uh, 25,000 miles completed in 67 hours. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Club today, you got a uh, birthday. Uh, Eric Marcus's wife, Leah. Leva. Leva. I'm sorry, Leva. It was uh, March 1st. And when several anniversaries, we have uh, Bruce Broomfield, Dave Dutz, Jeff Fiorita, Michael Hanley, Pete Landrum, and Rick Browns all have their anniversaries this week. <laughs> Some interesting facts I came up with. Banging your head against the wall for an hour burns 150 calories. <laughs> Somebody please test that and let me know how that works. <laughs> the color of orange is actually named after oranges. Before that, that never existed. The color never existed. <laughs> and they say snakes can predict earthquakes as far as 75 miles away. Gee, I guess that's because they're so close to the ground. Feel the roadway. And crimes often hold grudges against specific people. So, the oldest Norman joke was discovered on a 3,500-year-old Babylon, Babylonian tablet. I won't tell you what it said. Because it was just leaving. interpreted to say something that I really don't want to share here. <laughs> They said, this helps when you're scared to make yourself look bigger. 7% of American adults believe that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. During your lifetime, you will produce enough saliva to fill 50 bathtubs. That's what I'm talking kind of interesting. Baby octopus is about the size of a flea when it's born. Yeah, men get bored of shopping trips after 26 minutes. Don't know who did that, but five is my limit. So, wow. <clears throat> I'm just have to throw in some of these uh, stupid laws. Uh, in Washington, D.C., it's illegal to post a notice in public which calls another person a coward. Or refusing to accept a challenge or a duel. Hmm. And it's unlawful for small boys to throw stones at any time, at any place in the District of Columbia. The U.S. government says it's a crime to give false weather reports. <laughs> Just the guy that said today would be sunny. <laughs> and in Florida, a special law prohibits unmarried women from parachuting on Sunday or she shall risk the arrest, fine, and or jail. Also forbids rats from leaving ships in their dock at the end of the day. And Florida, failure to tell your neighbor his house is on fire is illegal. We might make this also in Florida. Women may be fine for falling asleep under a hair dryer. It has a salon on can as well. In Georgia, all citizens must own a rake. It's against the law to tie a giraffe to a telephone pole or a street lamp. In Georgia, the rules, it's, it is illegal to say, oh boy. So, I keep coming up with those, and some of them make me really laugh, and some of them are just kind of really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> One day, little Johnny came home and came up to his father and asked, Dad, where'd that come from? Dad squirmed a bit, but thought it was time his son knew the facts of life. He told him an expression of love and resulted in the beginning of life and how life developed, and finally how a child was born. As the story full of Johnny's eyes got wider and wider. When his father was finished, I said, wow, that's really neat. That sure means Billy. He said he's from Cleveland. <laughs> there was a film celebrating their golden wedding anniversary. Their domestic tranquility had long been the talk of the town. The local newspaper was inquiring as to the secret of the long and happy marriage. Well, it dates back to our honeymoon, explained the man. We visited the Grand Canyon and took a trip down to the bottom of the canyon to buy back mule. Sure. We found dogs too far, and my wife's mule stumbled. 
My wife quietly said, that's once. We proceeded a little further and the mules doubled again. Once more, my wife quietly said, that's twice. And about half a mile when my mules stumbled again, my wife quietly removed a revolver from her purse and shot the mule dead. I started to yell at her, treatment for mule, and she kept looking at me and said, that's once. <laughs> it's a man and woman have been married for more than 60 years. They shared everything. They had talked about everything. They had kept no secrets from each other, except that the little old woman had a shoebox in the top of her closet that she cautioned her husband never to open or ask about. For all these years, he had never thought about the box, but one day the little old woman got very sick, and the doctor said she would not recover. When she was looking at her the little old man took down the shoebox and took it to his wife's bedside. She agreed that it was time that he should know what was in the box. When he opened it, he found two crocheted dolls and a stack of money totaling $95,000. He asked her about the contents. She said, when we were married, my grandmother told me the secret to a happy marriage was to never argue. She told me that if I were in anger with you, I should keep quiet and crochet a doll. The little man was so moved, he had to fight back tears. Only two precious dolls were in the box. She had lived with him two times. In all those years, and he almost burst out with happiness. Honey said that explains the doll, but what about all this money? Where did it come? Well, oh, that's the money I made from selling the dolls. He came to the woman there. It wasn't that drunk yesterday. His wife said, You took the shed for head in your arms and told him to stop crying. Ron, for the worst end of the Dakota Bank, and forced the tellers to load a sack of cash into his bag. When I looked out the door, a brave North Dakota customer grabbed the hood and pulled it off, revealing the robber's face. The robber shot the customer without a moment's hesitation. He then looked around the bank and noticed one of the tellers looking straight at him. The robber instantly shot him also. Everyone in the bank by now was scared, looked intently down at the ground. The robber said, did anyone else see my face? There were a few moments of utter silence in which everyone was plainly too afraid to speak. Then one old Norwegian man named Ali from up north, town and raised his hand, said, My wife got a pretty good look at you. <laughs> there was a people that was golfing one day on a very, very exclusive golf course, lined with million dollar homes. On the third tee, the husband said, Honey, be very careful when you drive the ball. Don't knock into any of those windows. It'll cost us a fortune. The wife teed it up and shanked it right through a window. The husband cranched and said, I told you to watch me off for the houses. All right, let's go up there, apologize, and see how much this is going to cost. They knocked on the door and heard a voice say, come on in. They opened the door and saw glass all over the floor, a very unique-looking bottle laying on its side, broken in the foyer. A man sitting on the couch said, are you the people that broke my window? Uh, yeah, sorry about that, the husband replied. No, actually, I want to thank you. I've been a bottle for a thousand years. You released me. I'm allowed to grant three wishes. I'll give each one of you a wish, and I'll keep one for myself. Okay, great. I want a million dollars a year for the rest of my life, said husband. No problem. It's the least I can do. And what do you want? He said, asking the wife. I want to have a, house, a new house in every country in the world. Consider it done. And then the husband says to him, what's your wish, Jeannie? Well, since I've been trapped in that bottle, I've not been with a woman in a thousand years, and I want to sleep with your wife. The husband looks at the wife and says, well, we did get a lot of money, and you got all those homes. I guess I don't care. So they went upstairs a couple hours later. The guy turns over and he said, how old is your husband anyway? And she said, 35. And he still believes in genies. Amazing. <laughs> Success is some small numbers repeated day in and day out. And you're never too old to set another goal or a dream, a new dream. Today's lines. If you've been to Baskin Robbins, that's a dollar. 
If you've been to a Timber for Barn last week, that's a dollar. If you've ever been to Mount Rushmore, that's a dollar. If you believe in genies, <laughs> that's $20. <laughs> no more, no more. And if you're in your rotary pen, that's a dollar. Brandon, got to go. No, I'm just happy today on this beautiful, beautiful Friday. Yeah. Come on, for charity. Yeah, yeah now you can only wait. Yeah, there's one down. Okay, no one. I'll go. Um, I am going to be on rather short notice out for the next two weeks. Uh, Mr. Kusak will be stepping in for me in two weeks, I believe. I have to ask. Stephen Brown or Mike Cannon to hopefully back with me next week. I don't know if Mike Cannon is going to lead in person meeting though, <laughs> so I'm going to ask Stephen first. But my wife is going to a conference in Hawaii, which seems like a whole government boondoggle, um, and she asked me to come, so I'm going. <laughs> oh, I said, that's awesome. We should say a second week while we're there. She agreed. So we're going to spend a weekend in Waikiki, where I get to watch Hunter go to the aquarium in the zoo all day. And then we're going to fly over to the Big Island oh. and we rented an Airbnb so uh, right. way away from everybody else um, in the middle of nowhere, right on the beach. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we're going to look for birds and go up Mock Hill and mm -hmm. really dive on grenade for the team. So <laughs> I'll be thinking of you all. Um, I don't know why, but I'll be back on March 19th. So I won't be back at a meeting. Uh, so I think <laughs> March 24th. So I'll miss you all. <laughs> Anyone else <who's> happy? <laughs> Yes, sir. My grandson's on the big crystal box chain. Yeah. They were just up in Akron this week. And they won. I'll get it right. Okay, five. Judge is creating a word for the most creative. <laughs> Run up. Take him in a second. And that's right. and that qualified for the world tournament in Dallas in May. Well, I know. Because he had Who else? I'll give it a half. I'm happy about that Brandon is, is, is a runner. The means he's in great shape, which means while he's on the big island, he'll be able to make the swim from there to Oahu so we can go to Mauna Kea. No, not a chance. <laughs> I only swim in water with like over 80 degrees too, so I'm very, I like bad water. We won't do any late finds today. I assume you have a wonderful reason. But I just said you're going to be the uh, the uh, program leader next week. Congrats, win. <laughs> so I'll just keep that after. Uh, who else? Okay, Shannon. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, Beaver Creek finished their season last weekend. Um, I am so proud of them. They are ranked 34th in the state. And they made it to the third round, which was the second rated team in the state. And they played well. Um, pretty impressive. That was pretty awesome. Uh, also, uh, Ryla update. Uh, two weeks till Ryla. So I'll be here next week, but the following week I'll be out of camp. So if any of you guys want to come out and visit a camp, let me know. I can get you a schedule or an agenda um, if you want to present or introduce one of our speakers. We would love to have you. So um, it's a fun time, and uh, hopefully all the rain's getting out of the way, so we'll have a good, nice weekend. Very nice. Okay. So next Thursday at four o'clock, Fran, Patrick, Beth, and Alex that I are going to be participating in the four-way speech contest at the Beaver Creek High School. And after that, I will pick a winner, and you're going to get to hear them later on. Steven. Uh, just real quickly, um, just a reminder, put in your phones, July 21st is Rotary's Beaver Creek Golf Outing. Um, so we have a lot of members that say last year, so we'll be reaching out to you. Uh, as well as sponsorships. So uh, please go out into the markets and uh, find us some uh, more golfers and sponsors. So looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll lean in and go with announcements. I don't want to do that. Half, but I have to go. Yeah, I'm just looking at the. Did. Oh, me to do it? Okay. 
So pancake breakfast is April 15th. Um, there should be two clipboards going around. Oh, okay, just change the way. Um, one is for tickets and sponsorships, and then the other one is for a chart of us. You guys are good here. I'm going to start it here, and then you guys can circle it back. Um, chart of assignments. So if you'd like to volunteer to work that day, we have two shifts. One starting at seven, depending on what you're doing, is uh, starting at seven thirty until about nine, and then the other one is nine to twelve. Um, if you'd like to do both shifts, please make sure that you sign up on both of them. I'll take all that information, put it into a database, and then send out a link for an online sign up also for individuals who are here right now. Um, but please um, be sure to support the pancake breakfast, both in volunteering, but there's an also an opportunity to do sponsorships. Yes, there's a site on their uh, road that you can actually do individual tickets. And they're five dollars a piece, and we will have tickets next week. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? And just a reminder: May twelfth is fiftieth Founders Day, and uh, I really hope you all are keeping that on your calendar and be in attendance. Uh, I think we have a lot of Paul Harris fellows uh, handed out. I know we're going to have some, uh, I think, state senators coming and some other elected officials to be there. So. Uh, and that's May 12th, and that'll be right here. So the usual spot. So keep that on your calendars. Um, that, oh, I missed two. Take your own. Three, two, four, five, six, four. I feel like you're all conspiring. I said it. Yeah. So as you said, for you, I'm like, it's me. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's fair. <laughs> what am I looking for? I did proclaim before Pete does an introduction. Uh, I wanted to, I'm still reading. I've still been working on my goal. I'm at eight books now. Um, I can read this book, uh, you all have heard of it, called Braiding Sweetgrass um, by Robin Wall Kimmer. Um, just a phenomenal book. It talks a lot about uh, indigenous people, we'll say, and their connection to the land. And she was talking about gratitude. She has a whole chapter on gratitude. And it's just really, I was listening to it on the audio yesterday as I worked, and it was one of those, like, you hear it, you have to stop and go back. Um, it was so powerful. And, um, she's talking about this Thanksgiving address. It's this address that the, uh, the Shawnee, uh, go through and she said you can't listen to the Thanksgiving address without feeling wealthy and while expressing gratitude seems innocent enough it is a revolutionary idea and a consumer society contentment is a radical proposition recognizing abundance rather than scarcity undermines an economy that thrives by creating unmet desires gratitude cultivates an ethic of fullness but the economy needs emptiness the Thanksgiving address reminds you that you already have everything you need. Gratitude doesn't send you out shopping to find satisfaction. It comes as a gift rather than a commodity, subverting the foundation of the whole economy. That's good for me that's good medicine for land and people alike. So I thought that was a really good uh, quote yesterday. That book's called Braiding Sweet. It's by a uh, Roman Wall Kimmerer. With, with that, where's Mr. Pete Vance? Thank you. It was appropriate we have our county engineer here today on uh, a nice, soggy, wet day, considering she uh, has a lot of oversight of all the large culverts and bridges uh, so forth throughout the, uh, the county that are conveying, we hope, all of this uh, storm water. But I'll tell you a little bit about Stephanie. I've known Stephanie for 20 years now. So uh, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, engineering history and a lot of projects uh, we've been able to do together. She is a graduate of the University of Cincinnati. She has her master's degree from Wright State University. She began her career in, uh, let's see, like maybe a little bit county engineer's office, if I would call correctly. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and then in 2003, she became the city engineer for the city of Fairborn. That's where I got to meet her. And then she uh, took an interesting uh, job uh, path after that, 
in the village administrator uh, in Jackson Center, Ohio, near the lake. Um, from there, she went to the Montgomery County Engineer's Office uh, to provide a lot of real cool really projects there. And then from 2019 to present, have been the Green County Engineer. So please give a, a warm welcome to Stephanie. saying my water there. So um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we are glad this is not all snow. Um, normally this time of year, this would be snow. And if you want to put that in globally, usually about an inch of rain is about six inches of snow. So we will take this <laughs> um, from that perspective. So um, normally when I come and talk to you guys, I've been talking about paving, chip seal, and haven't had a lot of exciting projects going on. Today, you're going to find out that's completely different. Uh, we've got a lot of things in works, and all you are actually the first official group that's going to hear these announcements. So excited to be able to do this. Um, I have basically, we'll officially have doubled our engineering staff in May when our um, engineer comes on from graduation from ODU. But this is currently my latest hire. This is Kelly Miller. So she's our assistant engineer. Uh, we've had to increase engineers, increase inspectors, and you'll see why here in a few minutes why we've been doing this. So, um, perspective, like I said, usually we talk about paving, chip seal, we haven't really had any projects in the works. So go ahead and go to the next slide for me. Maybe. Okay. I'm going to share computer work. I am. <laughs> Jan. There we go. There we go. So, from a we would see about 330 miles of road, 283 up there, except for we just found two more bridges. So, a uh, lot of us have been computer free. Um, so, that number does constantly change. Sometimes we'll find culverts that are actually bridges, those type of things. So, that number periodically does change. That is on Mark Fairfield that we found one of the bridges that wasn't being in the grid and inspected. So, um, next slide, please. So I'm going to one that I talked about. You're going to see from the time I took over in 2019, which I mean, I took over during the Memorial Day tornadoes. Great way to start off. But um, from that perspective, you're going to see since I took over, I have made safety a priority. So you're going to kind of see that theme throughout, trying to make sure that our roads are as safe as possible. Um, I'm also going to talk about a couple projects, and we'll go from there. So next slide, please. So one of the things we did is we identified what are those highest crash locations we have in Rain County and what are those intersections of concern or intersections that we hear the most about that people feel are the highest crash locations. You can see the list up here on the screen. You're going to notice a lot of these or recognize a lot of these. Um, what we have done is we've been able to secure grant funding to study all of these intersections. So we received uh, funding for these. We've done safety studies. There's been stakeholders. So that usually includes fire, police, schools, townships, cities, um, our office, law enforcement, everybody at the table looking at these intersections. What are we seeing at these? And then we use a consultant to actually study what is really going on to dig into the crashes, what's actually the cause of crashes, and then what do we need to do to try to resolve those or reduce them? So like I said, you can recognize several of these up here, and this is where we're going to get into the weeds for you to make some exciting announcements. So next slide. First one, Fairgrounds and Hilltop. You guys know this one. You've known it for many years. Um, obviously, it's a skew, it's a hill, it's everything you can think of at that intersection. Um, next slide, please. So everything has pretty much been thrown at this end of the moon as far as flashing lights, additional signage, you name it, has been there and the crisis continue to occur. One of the interesting things that came out during the safety study was not what you think the reason of the crashes were. Um, a lot of times if you're sitting in an intersection, you're typically, you're focusing on hey, somebody coming up that hill, can I get out, those type of things. But the irony is you can see for miles to the other direction because it's wide open farm field. That's typically where the crash is actually, you're forgetting about that vehicle because you're so focused on the hill and the curb. So that was interesting what we kind of found when we got to digging into that. So next screen. So the safety study, obviously we want to make sure our intersections are safe. 
Um, you can kind of see who was involved in this. A traffic signal is not warranted at this intersection. Um, there are warrants we have to meet to be able to um, put up a traffic signal. We look at all types of alternatives. We look at road re anytime we're doing any safety studies, we're looking at is there just signage changes? Is there realignments need to happen? Traffic signals, turn greens, roundabouts, you name it. Um, we look at uh, what are the correct solutions for this. This one actually came out as being a roundabout. So um, this is only a concept drawing. This is not actually where it'll be to the inch. Um, this was out of the safety study itself, um, but just kind of gives you an overall idea of what this would look like. Next slide. From a funding perspective, I mentioned we did receive 90% funding to do the safety study. And then we have gone after funding for this. Um, this actually is the number six in the state of Ohio in rural crash locations in the entire state of Ohio. Uh, so from the perspective, so we have um, we went after funding this year. Um, we turned in three funding applications for safety funds for a couple of these projects that you're going to see mentioned here, and we were eventually successful on all three. So this is awesome. This is one of the first ones. So we have actually secured funding for this intersection. Um, like I said, it will be a roundabout. Um, approximately 3.5 million by the time you figure in engineering, environmental, right away acquisition, all those type of things that is federal aid um, from that perspective. So next slide, please. This is the room schedule. This is the schedule that we're locked in with with ODOT. We will be trying to expedite any of these projects we can from that perspective. So um, as far as right now, we have completed consultant selection. Right now, we are negotiating the contract with the consultant, and then they'll hit the ground to be able to actually start the design. But I said, right now, we're shooting to try to get these projects done earlier. We're hoping at least a year earlier, um, but we'll have to see how everything works out right away, acquisition, environment, all those type things, because we are within the little Miami watershed and some other things. So, so okay, next one. Oh, my garbage shut down your computer. Um, next one, obviously, you guys know this one well. Trade line and hilltop at ABC. Yeah. Um, again, I don't have to really give you the background on this one. You guys know this is one of the only concern of everybody. Next slide. Crash flies. Yeah, you're shifting on my computer. Um, you can kind of see crash flies. Obviously, we know this is a high crash intersection. This is one we definitely targeted. Um, from this perspective of crashes that are happening here, a lot of them are cars literally pulling out in front of, of, of other vehicles, even though it's, it's clear on the site, those type of things. But we also are high volume of traffic. Right now, we're between 12 and 14,000 vehicles a day on trade bike right now. And if you guys know the history of trade bike, you know, trade bike didn't even used to be where it's at currently. It actually used to be shifted to the east, um, kind of where Harlow Road is now. Uh, that's where it used to be, and it used to be a little one-leaf bridge. Uh, if you go back to the old area, you can see that. It's, it's really interesting how trade line has just exploded over the last 10, 15 years. So next slide, please. So why do we ever work at, again, we talked about, obviously, everything that's happened at this point. So we need to shift it. Um, as far as everything that's happened at this intersection, go to the next slide, please. So we did, again, the safety study on this um, from our perspective. Alex has been involved in this. His staff has been involved in this also. Um, this one, why we were putting together the funding application with all the development that's happening up and down trade line, we actually went ahead and started working on design already before we had funding for this project. We needed to get that location locked down so that we'd be able to hand that off to the developers so they really knew where this was going um, because literally development is happening right around this whole thing. So. Um, but it didn't come out as a roundabout. What you're going to notice is it looks a little big for a roundabout. So based on the traffic, of course, we're 10, I said 12, 14,000 right now on trade line, and that's going to keep increasing with all the development. So we have designed, are designing this as a multiple roundabout in the future, but it'll open as a single lane roundabout. We wanted to lock down that footprint so we didn't have issues coming back down the road when we need to expand it. So, but we'll open as a single lane roundabout. You'll also notice we kind of got a bypass lane here. So if you're going toward 35, there's kind of that movement again. And again, this is only a concept drawing. Obviously, the engineers will take it further design. It'll get tweaked, all those same things. Okay, next one. Okay, 
Um, again, security funding wise, this is the second one that we secured funding from. And actually, we have three pots of money on this right now. We'll probably end up with four. Um, from the perspective, we have the safety study money, and then we actually went after um, other pots of money for this too. So, um, okay, next one. Schedule wise, again, this is our schedule that you see up here. Again, we will be trying to expedite this as fast as we can. Again, we have selected the consultant on this project, and we're currently negotiating the consultant contract right now. So, okay, next one. This one, uh, the not in Beaver Creek area. This is another one that you guys probably are very familiar with. Obviously, Pete is very familiar with it. I was just with his, his trustees earlier this week. Um, 235 at Byron. Another one of those weird intersections with hills and curves and everything else and constantly have crashes there. So, okay. Um, again, several things have been done to this flight, advanced signage. Um, we did relocate the stop bar to try to realign vehicles a little better to have line of sight at this intersection as a short-term solution. It has helped some, um, but we still continue to have the crashes there. We have a fatality there. We don't know if it's truly related to the intersection that we did have a semi that dropped off the edge of pavement away from this intersection last year um, and was unable to recover and flip to semi. Um, unfortunately, that was a fatality. So, okay. So this will be a little different what's going to happen with this. So we're actually going to take a four-legged intersection and turn it into a three-legged. So you can see basically the Byron's going to be rewind and become a three-legged intersection. There'll be a left turn lane here. You kind of be able to sit there safely while you're waiting to be able to turn left and not get but that. I can't say the word. Um, from that perspective. Um, obviously, some grading will happen here, those type of things. And then we've been working with Bath Township as far as what will happen to the other part. You want to go to the next slide? Okay. So, what we're going to do to the south is actually vacate a portion of Byron Road. So, you can see we're going to be cutting off so that leg will no longer be there. Property owners here will have um, access via driveways. And then this is keeping access going to the cemetery that is here. All this land surrounding is actually all fair warrants to that. So we're going to get to houses in there, those types of things. Um, the road will remain up to the cemetery, but basically they're going to stop traffic here, have a cul-de-sac that serves all the houses here, and then they will limit the access to the cemetery. Stephanie, may I have a quick? Um, yes, that intersection is terrible. I see so many near-death accidents there mm -hmm. um but your drawing goes through that person's property how do you handle that as far as we'll have right away acquisition okay and again it's only a concept that design completely changed whether it's a true just arc or whether it's a curve or those type of things that's what design wise so yeah i was just kind of out of the safety study itself uh, basically you're teeing up that so you've got when you come up to it you'll have that clear line of sight and then the intersection will be adjusted elevation wise too okay. so. Yeah. Um, this one is actually, this was the third one we got funded this year, and this one actually will be run by Oath because it is a state room. But this is where we felt it was important enough to drive this project, um, even though it was a state route. Um, we knew it was important to the residents of Grady County, so we did the safety study, or paid for, it got the money for the safety study. We helped them put the application together, um, everything else, and then kind of said, here, oh, God, here you go. Um, so they will be running it, but we will be continue to be involved in it. So to keep that relationship with township and with the residents there. So okay, next. <clears throat> Again, kind of the schedule, and like I said, ODOT will be running this project. They currently have their consultant selected, and then they are working on locking down their contracts. So all of these all have funding in the uh, November time period. So it's kind of working through that normal schedule that we would go through. Okay, next. This is the one that you guys probably have been asking about. Alex and I talk about it all the time. But and we literally just came from the pre-construction meeting. That's where we came from. So you guys are pretty here with it. You know, this is a high crash location. Uh, we pushed and pushed to finally get this project funded. It's real. Um, if you haven't been by it in the last week, you're going to find that it's real. Um, from that perspective, this is really amazing. So um, go to the next slide. Obviously, you know what the backup looks like. It's even actually during COVID, which was interesting. 
right at the beginning of COVID with the drone footage. So I said, this is basically currently the, the first traffic signal that you encounter driving two hours across the state of Ohio from West Virginia. And actually now it's longer now that they've added the new four lane in West Virginia um, on 35 also. So now it's even longer than two hours. So this is the first signal that you encounter. Uh, typically the types of crashes that are happening here are usually semi versus car, which is the worst kind of crashes. So, um, as you can see, there's essentially usually rear end crashes and we're side swiping because they're trying to avoid the rear end crash. Okay. So what does it look like? That's what it looks like. Um, if you're familiar with Daniela Springs at 675, similar layout. Um, think of this being the high school over here, Fairborn High School. Think of this being over here, BP Station, those type of things. So that's similar. Footprint. Um, you're going to see basically it shifted away from the park in the river. And then um, because of that, that's why it is a different configuration because it happened to stay out of Little Miami River. Um, definitely a lot of environmental restrictions on this project because of being the Little Miami, because of being near the um, well fields, you name it. So actually, we're still waiting on the 404 permit on this. Um, they hope to have it in the next two to three weeks. Um, still working through that process. So um, from that standpoint, so, so it will be a full interchange. No more signals down on 35 when it's done. Um, right now, the way it is, it will open without signals at the top of the ramp. But if Alex keeps blowing up in development over there, that may change before we get done with this project. Um, at, when traffic hits the right point, that's when signals will need to go over the top of the maps. So. Obviously, uh, so this was designed before everything was happening on Trey Barn and everything else. So, okay. Um, from a standpoint, I know Alex and I have talked about the history on this before from a perspective of the um, owners of the track presentation before, not been successful in funding. Alex and I did the presentation a couple times. We were fortunate, we had a year in there where COVID, they didn't even do applications, um, but we were fortunate to be able to secure funding for this. Um, thank you to the Green County Commissioners. They were able to put up 20% for us um, to make this have skin in the game and make this a real project. So it is a real project. Okay, next. Um, kind of the design has been going on and everything else. So the construction definitely came in higher than original, but that's not surprising. Right now we're seeing about a 30% increase in construction costs right now due to everything that's going on um, from that perspective. So this project was bid in January, um, awarded to Eagle Bridge out of Sydney, Ohio, um, for $40.3 million. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, what you're seeing out there is not the actual construction itself right now. What you're seeing out there, if you've not drove by lately, is they're doing tree removal and utility relocation. Um, we just came from the pre-con meeting, so the contractor will be kind of starting officially um, beginning of April. So that's currently his game plan. So I'm going to start the next screen. If you have not been by here in the last week, that's what it looks like now. Uh, I mean, completely different. You're going to, your job is probably going to drop when you're right by. So from that perspective, and that's, mm -hmm. it's definitely an eye opener. So from that perspective, so. so you're on trade by and looking at 35 right there. Yeah, so I'm sitting in here at the light, not moving. Um, <laughs> so you can look up. Um, so this is 35 coming toward um, toward here. So, and they're continuing to cut trees. They've got about another week on cutting trees other than what's in the wetlands. Right now they're waiting on the 404 permit so they can deal with the trees that are in the wetlands that need to cut. <clears throat> oh. Any questions on, before I jump ahead of this, any questions on any of those four projects? Yes, sir. How much right away on the other side, the 200 acre side? How much did you get? So that was all donated on the south side of the road. So we only had acquisition from American Aggregate, um, a pro property owner, and a small piece from Phillips. Everything else was donated on the south side. So that far field, the developer donated it all. And thanks for Alex for helping us be able to acquire that. So. Any other questions on the four projects? Yes, sir. Of course, this. You still had that factory in 35 as a list on the project list, but that project is finished. And it's this new fancy stuff that you guys have put in. 
That's how much like like you're going towards one of the parts more compared to this. We are on the roads, yes. But we don't do a ring about just to do a ring about either. We're going to pick what the right alternative is for that session. So it's not always a roundabout. So is this fancy change that's gone through? Has it helped the precious? I don't know, the tree and orchard, the where they're doing the, the one that's finished already. Yeah, that's not tree and orchard. Um, so that OSHA will tell you that's not our project, it's ODOS. Um, it has reduced crashes, it has decreased congestion. They will tell you it is a short-term solution. It's a short-term. Yes, there still is a project on the books to make that interchange. That is correct. Um, but right now they need to do something. Alex, do you remember what the cost was on that last week? What was it, like 65 or something million? Full interchange? Yeah. 100. There we go. Yeah. Because you're talking about two intersections. You're talking about orchards and Yeah. I just saying. Yeah. Okay. 100 million for the energy. Oh, we have to kick in what percentage? 20%. 20%. Yeah. To even be considered. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Super Street project, it does work. I know not everybody is a fan of it. We know that. Like I said, it is an ODOT project, not ours. Um, not at Palatinson. It's, it's not Houston. It's not Green County. Um, it's ODOT, um, but it does work. Crashes are significantly down. Um, the OSP ran the numbers the other day. Crashes are way down, actually, at this. Um, if there are crashes, they're not severe crashes, um, which is, that's what we want. I mean, if we have fender vendors, it's still okay, as long as we're not having the severe crashes and fatalities. Um, and congestion is definitely better. Um, we're not having these huge backups we used to have all the way almost to North Fairfield. So whether you like it or not, um, it works. And that's what we want to make sure everybody can get home safe. So from that perspective, and like I said, there's people that like it. Yeah. It's like an east and west. Yeah, east and west like it. People that are going across, they don't like it. That's in general what we see. So, yes, sir. So, when I was growing up in Connecticut back in the 50s, they were very popular. Called rotaries. Uh -huh. So, what's the big fascination all of a sudden now, 50, no, 75, 70 years later, on building roundabouts uh, for intersections? Sure. So, I will do a little clarification on that too. So, rotaries or traffic circles are actually different than a roundabout. So the old rotaries or traffic circles that you think of in some of these towns, you think of over in England and some of these other countries that were going back in the 60s, 70s, um, worked completely different. So those was the people that were entering uh, had the right of way that were in that are entering. But in the roundabout, the people that are in the roundabout have the right of way. So from a perspective, you the crashes are about 70% less. For a roundabout, um, they're going to slow you down. They're going to take you down to about 20 miles an hour when you're going through a roundabout. So if you do have a crash, again, they're not your fender benders. They're not those t bone type crashes or right angle crashes that are the most severe that usually result in fatalities um, from that perspective. And if you're entering one, yes, we're going to be doing a lot of education on how to drive them and everything else. Um, but when you enter them, when you're sitting at that Thing. Most of the time, you're not going to have to stop. You're going to yield, you're, but you're going to yield to who's inside the circle. You're only having to look to your left versus a traditional intersection that you've got to be looking in every direction. You're only looking, is somebody coming from my left? If they're not, then you go. And then you've got the right of way over everybody else. So, if it thanks for help, when I lived in Sydney in mm -hmm. 89 and 90, Australia, they had a really good roundabout commercials that they were running. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and I was in Australia when the world shut down. Um, and it's interesting going through around about the opposite direction. <laughs> yes, sir. When it would be gray mine and 35 mm -hmm. now at the long exit ramp, all of that, there's a little park. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we going to lose that? We will not lose the park. So the existing Trayvine Road will turn into the park entrance to right. the park, but the access for the park will be maintained the entire time. And um, even kayak traffic will be maintained <laughs> if they can get on the river um, from that perspective. Um, but that will all be maintained long term. So um, from a construction season wise, 
I said they're going to be starting in April. It's about a two and a half year construction season because of maintaining traffic. Um, the contractor this morning at the pre-con actually took out one of the road closures out, so they won't be closing Valley. Um, there was planned in having to do a short road closure for Valley to get some drainage across. He's going to board it. Is that completely off the table? So basically, when he puts starts his construction, he's going to be in about the same configuration probably through mid-summer. Um, and he'll basically be focusing on the bridge first. So you're not going to see a lot of effects on 35 the first phase of construction. He's going to be focused on getting all that fill in, getting and getting that bridge built first, um, and then going from there. So um, we say two and a half years um, because they're going to have to finish up at final asphalt, those type of things, probably that last year, um, just because we're running in a tiny year. So one follow up question on that. Yes, sir. Will there always be the ability to get on or off from Trayvon 235 during the district? Full interchange, yes. And then may, traffic will be made behind the whole time. Sure. There will be, yeah, there will be times that there might be night closures or like lane reductions, those type of things taken down to one lane. There'll be times there'll be crossovers. Obviously, they've got to keep shifting traffic around all the time. Um, right now, yes, yeah, traffic will be maintained all the time. All these projects are up on our website. So you can take a look at them, dig in them deeper on the facts, everything else, especially since my slide cut off a little bit on these um, from that perspective, but they all are all both on there. Any other questions on any of those four? Okay, there's a couple slides that are not up here that I'll tease you that we haven't put up on the website yet. Um, we secured another project, <laughs> actually two, um, officially with the MBRBC vote that happened yesterday. Um, so Indian Ripple at Factory um, is one of those, and that will actually be a traffic signal with turn lanes. And that one's going to be a challenge because of the river and all the parks and everything else around it. Um, that's definitely going to be an adventure. And then we've been working on safe routes to school. Um, for Beaver Creek School, did not have any of their schools in St. Francis School program at all. Um, we worked last for a little over a year and a half um, on St. Francis School. You basically have to develop a travel plan for each campus first, and then you can actually apply for funding. Develop the travel plan for Coy and Trayvine first, but that's where all the development is happening. Um, got that travel plan figured out last year. Um, we applied for funding last year. We were not successful. Um, we went for a different pot of money, and uh, we secured the first piece of that, um, where they'll be kind of building the path in front of the school along Dayton Senia. Long term, that'll continue to be added onto um, up and down Dayton Senia as we keep going after funding. But at least we finally got a piece of it, which will make ODOT happier because now we can show where we're starting from, because that was a question we had last year. And the other location goes in today um, by five o'clock, which I last of the support letters um, from that perspective to try to get the actual sidewalks on campus out to that path. So, but if you've been by that school, they are literally on an island. They have no sidewalks at all, nothing connecting to any of the neighborhoods. So this is basically trying to work out to connect to those neighborhoods. So. Okay, I'm just going to mention these two projects. Um, we talked a little bit about it before. Um, one with the bike. Obviously, if you've been out to Costco in that whole area, you know what it becomes during peak hours. You probably avoid it or you sit in traffic, one or the other. Um, so this is a project we took on. Um, basically, we kept hearing somebody needs to do something about it. And I stepped up and said, well, okay, let's figure out what we're going to do about it. So we have Sugar Creek Township, City of Centerville, and ourselves involved in this project. We have two things going on. One, we're looking at the interchange. Two, you can't just fix the interchange. If you just fix the interchange, you just move them to the next light, and then they just sit. So we actually have a plan, a study, looking at all the local road networks around it of what needs to happen to those two. Is it widening feed wire, Little Sugar Creek, intersection improvements, all those type of things. The hope is that we can go after funding for some of those little projects while we're working on the big budget. Um, we've been progressing on this. Um, we secured some track funding for engineering on this project. And then we've also, also um, secured some money from Turner's office also um, for preliminary engineering. So that's been progressing. There will be a public um, involvement this spring that will basically present the alternatives for this interchange 
and then um, make a decision on what that solution will be, continue to take the design along and hopefully be able to secure funding for it. So definitely exciting. Um, we're using the Montgomery County TID to run the project for us. Um, this bridge is unique. Um, so it actually sits in two counties. It sits in Montgomery and Green County, right down the middle of the bridge. So it's actually in two Otama districts also. So it's made it a little bit of a challenge. So, but the good thing is that I've been great working with all this. So, okay, next slide. There you go. Um, the other one that Alice and I have been working on is the Valley Bell Connector. Um, this has been on the books for a while. Alice and I have been talking about it, um, but it's becoming a reality. Uh, whether you agree or not, and some people don't agree with this, but um, we know if you build the interchange, they will come. This is all land that's prime for development. Um, this project has been on the books for a very long time, um, back since 1991. Um, but we know the reality is now that the interchange is coming, all the development that's happening in this area, we need to be prepared. So um, you can kind of see it's broken into four phases. That's what the different colors are. We don't know what we'll be building in necessarily in that order, though. Um, Beaver Creek Township, obviously, I think Alex, you talked about the fire station and everything. Um, but his fire station is going right here next to the airport. So this is the is phase one is actually phase one, but the other could change. Really, it's going to kind of depend on how development happens. Do we land a large box company? Do we what? Um, we'll kind of drive that, and that's how we designed it. Um, we're currently at 50% design. As of this week, we got the 50% submittal um, for phase one. And we have basically the whole corridor defined preliminary engineering-wise from a perspective of if we land somebody tomorrow, we need to move quickly. We'll have the ability to go design build if we need to versus having to go traditional design um, in-house. So, okay, next. Any questions on the Valley Bell project? I just want to teach you that one a little bit. Okay. I also talk about paving. Um, we're still looking down our paving, but here are the two big ones. Dayton Yellow Springs, the entire Dayton Yellow Springs, and all of Federal. These are two long roads. Um, but we were able to secure not only federal funding for this, but also high public works funding. So leveraging those federal and state dollars, so it's less money we have to spend um, out of our pocket um, and be able to leverage it. So that allows us to do other projects that we're trying to do. So both of these are scheduled for this year. And then Beaver Creek has three roads. They actually um, got federal funding for also that we're assisting them with um, Orchard Factory and Yellow Brick Road. So. Okay. All right. Any questions? <clears throat> I did decent on time. Thanks, sir. So be quick. Okay. Right. Yes, one question. We've been doing that 675. Uh, that program. We took the grand hall. Oh, Plus, that's right there. The corners on the side of the So, yeah. um, I know the developer is working on their next phase. How about uh, have you considered just moving Costco out of there? <laughs> <laughs> So, even if you don't like the Soup Street, people will not let you be here at Costco. <laughs> yes, sir. I love Costco, so no, it's not moving. Thank you for addressing that area. Yes, thank you. I have one who lives on the other side of town, and I clearly avoid that side of town. Yeah, like the place. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, keep watching our social media. Obviously, we'll put it, be putting out press releases when we hit that public involvement period here in the next few months. Um, but that's a time to reach out. I will be putting stuff up on the website. Um, regarding the interchange, um, one of the things we talked about um, at Trade Mine and 35, regarding that is um, we will be putting out weekly, us and ODOT, uh, kind of an update of what's going on if there's significant changes in traffic flow, those type of things. So follow our social media at Green County Engineer. You can follow ODOTs, but honestly, they're just hard to, they don't, Make it easy to read. Um, follow ours, um, and we'll share their stuff. And then also, I have access to the Green County to the Green County Sheriff's app. If you don't have that app, put it on your phone. Um, that's where we push out a lot of stuff. Um, we'll be pushing out on that project. We push out um, if we've got things like roads closed due to crashes, significant crashes, those type of things. Beaver Creek City sends us their significant ones. Also, we push those out for them. Um, those type of things. So it's a good just Google Green County Sheriff in the app, either in the App Store or Google Play, and you can pull it up. He also pushes out other stuff on his on his page also. But okay, 
Steve, do you have a 30 second question? Yes. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm not leading to rumors, so I don't need to put you on the spot, but from mm -hmm. understanding from what I heard is you're a big city barbecue fan. Yeah. Yeah. You catered for me, tell us that. Yes. Okay. And you can have that as well. So, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a $5 for it. I know. It's fine, I'll find the show. That's a pretty good. That is an extra $6. So. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. And, like I said, um, feel free to look on our website too for additional information. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. When Ash and I were looking for a house four years ago, we specifically refused any house that required exit seven. I mean, we literally just won't even look at it because it's so bad. So I'm glad that's being addressed. Um, so we have a book. Uh, I'll make sure you sign them before we take it back. Uh, Rocks and Minerals. Uh, and we will dedicate that to uh, in your honor to you a free library. Um, uh, my list, I failed to update it. Uh, the Cusack next week for beers. I think that is wrong. I want to say it's Jerry Pfeiffer and Mike Canada. I think that's that's my mind telling me. So, hopefully, um, next week's speaker is Chris Kendall. He's discussing medical fraud. So, that'll be a good one. Um, is there anything else for the good of the club? Okay. Uh, Ma'am, would you be willing to leave some of the pledge allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I can't really go play this thing. Must have lost this. I'm going to have to go a lot smaller. No battery sponsor. Oh, boy. The white car's all right.